Welcome to the Ethics Experts, where we're elevating ethics and compliance and HR to the strategic level it's supposed to be. Hey everybody, welcome to the Ethics Experts. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. And if you're a returning subscriber, hey friend, you are good enough, smart enough, and people like you. You see what happens when you subscribe to the Ethics Experts? You get a bonus greeting on every, on every single episode, and sometimes it's a Stuart Smalley greeting. Uh, I'm here with Brian Frazier. How's it going, Brian? Going great, Nick. Thanks for having me. Uh, Brian is Director of Compliance and Audit at a um, publicly traded chemical manufacturing company. And uh, we have some similar passions, so I'm excited to have you on and, uh, and to dive right in. So, um, yeah, you too. So tell us a little bit about like, the, uh, the purview of, of your role right now, the stuff that, that you sort of cover on both the sort of compliance and the audit side. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a unique role. I, I was originally hired on as the director of global compliance uh, for this company. It's, the company's called RPM. And we're a chemical manufacturer, multinational company um, with footprint pretty much everywhere throughout the world. And um, there was an opening in the compliance uh, or in, t in the internal audit department. And uh, my boss at the time said, you know, we need to kind of revamp that program from a compliance perspective. We had somebody in there that was completely audit focused and not compliance focused. And so I took the opportunity to come into the internal audit department and um, revamp uh, that structure from a compliance perspective more than what it had been. It's really more finance testing, traditional kind of audit approach. And um, it gave me an opportunity uh, to have visibility throughout our whole company where I had limited visibility in serving parts of our company as the position was split up with another counterpart that we collaborated with to handle compliance throughout the whole company. So now it gave me a better opportunity to have visibility to the whole company where I just didn't have that before. So um, I love that opportunity to revamp the program and uh, again, have visibility to the whole company where I didn't before. So it's been um, that role for me for the last two years of my four years being with this company. And it's allowed me to travel many places in the world. So it's been, been really cool. Got some stamps in that passport, huh? A few. A few. <laughs> so, uh, so it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like for the first two years, um, you know, your function essentially was separated between two people essentially. And now that's been sort of consolidated into you. Um, talk to me about before that consolidation, what pain points came from there being this sort of audit person on one side and sort of the compliance person on the other side. Yeah, so, you know, we didn't really have the compliance background on the audit side, so that was kind of a frustrating part of our compliance program. It was intentionally built to to try to handle anti-bribery and anti-corruption mm -hmm. um, and focus on audits in that fashion, but uh, didn't have the compliance background to, to help, I think, make that more valuable. So uh, our company, my company, is very um, decentralized. So we have multiple, multiple hundreds of subsidiary companies throughout our organization. We're the parent company of a very largely decentralized network of subsidiaries. So our visibility to start out with is very poor to begin with. And um, when you have that audit structure without the kind of the compliance focus to it to handle that piece of a compliance program, of understanding from auditing and monitoring how that can benefit the company and provide visibility to it. Um, that was the challenge that, that we had and that I was able to kind of um, improve upon when I transitioned into this role. So that's actually really interesting. Um, that's how you can make it more valuable, essentially by showing the organization that it has better visibility into things and can sort of see around the curve. As sure. you were kind of considering this new role, this sort of consolidated role, what sort of like vision did you have for it? And, you know, how have you been surprised or not uh, in achieving that vision? Yeah, so compliance in general, I mean, my, I've been in the compliance, you know, specific type of role for eight years, compliance type of roles for, you know, 20 some years. And similar type of thing, no matter where you go, you know, nobody in compliance is getting Christmas cards from people in the business. <laughs> you know, we're, yeah. not, we're not the most favorable looked on person. So audit is even worse right. in some ways, right? Because the, the perception that audit has about coming in and doing audits and those kinds of things is probably even more seen as a negative with some parts of the business than compliance is. So now I get the joy of having compliance and audit in my title. 
And uh, that means even even less Christmas cards than I was getting. <laughs> uh, but you have to understand where people see that and and work towards bridging that that perception or breaking down those that perception of those silos. And so much of what I do, even though it's under the title of audit, it's really about educating and developing that those uh, uh, relationships with key business people in far flung places in the world that don't have a lot of engagement with anybody at our parent company, let alone uh, someone from a compliance and audit background. So it's done under the spirit of being very, uh, you know, educational uh, approach, very, uh, you know, seeking to understand, very, uh, you know, focused on seeing how they see things, feeling how they feel things from their perspective, uh, because I don't know. I don't know their business. I don't know them. They don't know me. And uh, that approach um, has worked out wonders in, you know, developing those relationships where they feel comfortable in uh, reaching out to me or reaching out to somebody else, maybe understanding the larger picture than they did before about concerns, issues, questions that they've had to learn on their own before because there really wasn't that level of engagement before. And so what was the path toward that? Like, how did that look? Like, what was the shape of it? Was it like a linear path? Was it like, boy, I was beating my head against the wall and then the floodgates opened. And how did you sort of navigate through that? Because I would, I imagine it's not sort of, I imagine it wasn't instant, right? I mean, you took over this role and it probably took some time to sort of start to build those relationships across this decentralized, you know, network that is your company. Yeah, and it's 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 going to continue to be a challenge because each one of our companies is is basically an island of itself. Yeah, right. So I go to one place and I develop start developing that that communication and that networking and that and that uh, you know ability for them to get some level of comfort with the whole process of going through a compliance audit, which is anxiety ridden to begin with. Yep. Um, And so you have to be very uh, you know mindful in how you approach it right from the get go. Um, and so there's a lot of things that go into the buildup of that communication wise, um, you know, holding these remote calls, but really what it comes down to is when I get on a plane and I'm spending a week in, you know, in Korea, or I'm spending a week in uh, Bogota, Colombia, or I'm spending a week in uh, Dubai, um, that's where that interpersonal discussions and getting to know people and not just asking you know, things about their business, but getting to know them, their culture, what, you know, just getting to know them as people. Right. right? And, um, you know, that brings about a lot uh, of goodwill that certainly they feel comfortable later in reaching out to me and say, listen, I, I think we have a question or I think I have a concern. They didn't really understand it before. Mm -hmm. Or they feel comfortable and say, listen, you seem like a nice guy. I feel comfortable in reaching out to you. Right. Right. And that has happened uh, many, many times where things have turned into, you know, maybe it's turned into an investigation, maybe it's turned into some type of training opportunity, maybe it's turned into collaboration with other people that they didn't even know to reach out to an organization with maybe a purchasing question or a uh, procurement thing or, you know, something else that could be something that they didn't understand because they've been used to doing things on their own in this decentralized kind of structure. Yeah, I think. So that's, that's a great answer. Um, I, I would imagine that it would be easy to get sort of overwhelmed with the, you know, challenge you have in your job. You have all these companies across the world. There's different cultures, like, you know, country-based cultures. There's different, you know, sub you know, there's different, you know, subsidiary-based cultures. There's subcultures within those cultures. I mean, it's very difficult. Um, yeah. But – I can tell by your by the way you talk about it. You see this as like a massive opportunity. How huge, how huge. how have you how how have you how have you been able to keep that frame? Or like what has caused you know what's prevented you from falling into the you know the other side of that fence, which is like totally overwhelmed by it, you know, paralyzed by you know the mountain that is you know getting all these people to comply with you know the company's the company's you know code or the the local yep. laws and all that stuff. Yeah, no, it's it, it can be a huge challenge. We've had some areas that uh, have been, from an audit perspective, just what we would consider to be complete failures. And yeah. then, you know, do you do you look at it from a perspective of you guys don't know what you're doing, and do you not know what you're doing because our training was bad, our communication is bad, 
you know, what's the root cause of, of some of these things? And it's usually this, it's, not, it's rarely a situation where I look at management or I look at an organization, I say, you know, I put the blame on, you know, leadership there at the local place. It's really bigger than that because we don't do a good job of communicating. We don't do a good job of training our people. Historically, we haven't done a great job. And so it's very easy to point fingers and blame when you, from from an audit perspective or compliance perspective, say you guys aren't doing your third party due diligence correctly. You guys are not handling your onboarding from a compliance perspective properly. Right. Uh, they just don't know. We have businesses that range from you know two million dollars in revenue, five million dollars in revenue per year to uh, close to a billion dollars. Right. And and right. everything in between. And <laughs> that, that I mean that in itself is crazy. I mean, yeah. you're dealing with different levels of like program maturity, company That's maturity. Right. Those are all different waves to ride, you know? Right. And the ability for those kinds of small organizations to have proper segregation of duties. Good luck. Right. So we have to find solutions that are unique uh, because there's not a one size fits all approach. So you have to approach it in a way that understand their business, understand yeah. the people, understand their structure. They all do things a little bit differently and then work with them to find a solution that works for them that still can be seen as uh, a way forward that mitigates risks or gets them on the right path that, that we feel comfortable with. So a couple of things I want to kind of underscore in the way you, you described it is that first there's like a, there's a real consistency in everything you've said. There's a real sort of people forward focus. There's a high agency focus. There's a, you know, a positive sort of like this, you know, an opportunistic energy behind what you're talking about. First of all, um, I also think it's pretty interesting that it sounds like, you know, whether intentionally or not, your first focus is building trust. And I think in building trust, you're focusing less on yourself and you're kind of assuming positive intent. And maybe that's from the way you're wired. Maybe that's just from having been in the game for a while. And you see that, you know, most people are well intending and when they screw something up, it's because they, they don't know. But I just want to like, I just want to cir circle back on that because I think the average response is one of, you know, it's sort of a lower agency response or maybe call it a fixed mindset response. Uh, versus, you know, this sort of growth mindset that you're talking about where, hey, I can, there's something different that I can do. There's something different that our department can do that I need to rule out before I start kind of attributing, you know, blame on the other side of it. That's Was right. that a That's cultural right. shift that you had to sort of bring to your team? Was that present to some degree? Like, and how did you sort of develop that, that, that view of the people that you're helping to, you know, uh, you know, inform whatever train? Yeah, it's a work in process. I mean, historically, our company has not had a, a, a robust compliance program. We've uh, been a publicly traded company for a number of years. Um, we've had some compliance failures that are publicly known and, and available to, to read about a number of years ago. But before I came in, um, the department, the compliance department was one guy for handling, wow. uh, you know, compliance matters for a multinational company at the time was was maybe five billion dollars, you know, per year. So you can imagine that it was putting out high level fires. It was putting the basics of a foundation in place of a code of conduct, of training, of policies that were not there before, you know, 10 years ago. So now you flash forward, I've been here four years and the amount of time it takes to get um, ingrained in the business to a level where you feel like people even know who you are, um, and developing that kind of, you know, trust to some degree um, is going to be a continued working process. We buy a lot of companies. We yeah. acquire a number of companies every year, small, medium sized, you know, whatever. And so it's constantly an, uh, an environment where we're adding, you know, family run businesses that have been family run businesses for 25 years. And they want to continue doing business, but they want to grow their business where that's where we come in and provide that level of service gain them capital, gain them into markets, but they have the mindset of being a family run company, right? right? A publicly traded company. So there's a lot of handholding. There's a lot of uh, education. There's a lot of uh, opportunities to get that right, right from the get go when those things happen. But for our existing people, uh, it's a work in process or existing companies. And um, that will continue probably for a long time to um, you know, further develop those relationships, further develop that trust, 
But that's why I handle it in the way I do right from the get go is because that historically it's not been done and they don't know any different because they really haven't had that history before. That acquisition forward, decentralized uh, thing, multinational, companies of all these different sizes, I mean, I just can't underscore enough kind of how challenging that could be and how overwhelming it could be. Um, how do you draw a, like, a consistent thread uh, between all these different organizations, right? You have all these subsidiaries. How do we tie them to the sort of things that matter at the corporate level but allow for the individuality and the sort of individual cultures to persist because – those are necessary, you know? Yep. Those, that's, that's a constant, um, it's, it's a balancing act of, of where that pendulum kind of swings a little bit. Um, we want to keep the businesses being their own entrepreneurial spirit. It's part of our culture of our company. That's what's made us successful. Uh, but that entrepreneurial spirit can only go so far. So when you're talking about legal issues, you're talking about HR, you're talking about IT, you're talking about compliance, you're talking about some of those things that we need to have consistency on. We need to have standardizations on to a degree. Um, that's where that uh, language historically has not been there um, for our companies that we have been working on since I've been on uh, the last four years, uh, trying to develop what those standards are, what those foundations are, what those consistencies need to be, and educate our, our, our uh, management teams and our various businesses to say, listen, you are great at being an entrepreneurial and going to market in these product developments and your marketing campaigns and your sales and your, and your business operations, you know, great. These are the areas we're trying to develop consistency on and, and standards on because it, it brings us a uh, level of execution across our whole organization where we try to have some similarities in how we do things. So, yeah, we have standards that are ultimately defined by our code of conduct. We have certain global policies that are um, applicable to everybody in the organization, but the, even those are difficult because we have to write them in a, present them in a broad manner mm -hmm. uh, because they don't necessarily fit very easily into our varied, decentralized, diversified structure. So we have to kind of set what the floor is going to be, and then they can go above that, but they can't go below what that floor is, whatever that policy or standard may be. So educating around that, presenting that in that kind of, uh, you know, way of communicating um, has been helpful, but it's going to continue to be something that we have to work on. Yeah. And this is kind of the LCD dilemma. I call it the lowest common denominator dilemma. Like lowest common denominator uh, comedy is like not funny to anybody. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so like you run the risk of like developing a, a lowest common denominator, like code or something that, sure. you know, can be really kind of an umbrella over everything, but it's not even resonant. It's not special enough. Right. Um, and that can be a challenge. Just curious. Um, every company probably has some set of values, probably explicit values as you fold them into your organization through an acquisition perspective. How do you guys think about those values? Do you try to tie those values to the, to the broader company values? Do you actually replace those values? And I guess what I'm getting at is there's kind of two ways to do acquisitions. There's two ways to sort of conquer a people, uh, yep. There's the Babylonian way and the Persian way, okay? So the Babylonian way is they would just take everybody and boom, you're Babylonian now. And yep. then the Persian way, it was like, you can maintain, you know, you're part of our kingdom, but you can maintain your culture and you can maintain yep. your your culture. And it sounds yep. like you guys are a little bit more Persian than the Babylonian approach, but how do you navigate through that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great way of, of describing that. Um, in fact, I'm probably going to steal that take and, it. and use that in the future. It, yeah. I stole it um, myself, so don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think what you'll find is, you know, companies will have, you know, their values that are probably similar in a lot of ways. Right. They might be called something else. They might be, uh, you know, seen a little bit differently, but they fall in the same ballpark. And it's it's understanding that culture from a company that we've acquired. And how does that already nicely line up, dovetail into what we already are presenting and talking about, and that's already part of our verbiage in some way. It may not line up specifically, but there's commonalities that you can certainly glean from. And how do we leverage that to, you know, speak similar language to what they've already known and understand? And we might twist our words a little bit to fit, you know, that environment some. It's finding the commonalities that make sense. And I'm not one to beat somebody over the head and say, no, no, these are our values and you need to shed whatever words and language you're using. I think they need to have 
an understanding of what our code of conduct is? Absolutely. But if we can be flexible in how we communicate, um, you know, especially in the onboarding phase and what that means for the next, you know, six months or a year as they get integrated into our business in other ways, then I think that's just a natural progression as things things further develop, right? But we shouldn't be looking at it from, you know, we're taking over and this is the language and this is the the types of things. We need to understand what their histor- history is, what they how they speak, what they what they value, what those words are, and then how do we find commonalities that we can use to have good conversations about what that means now to be part of RPM. You know, you've touched this, you've touched on this a couple of different ways so far. Um, but what I think is really inspiring about your story is in a couple of short years, you've done a pretty significant like rebrand, so to speak, of your function, the function that you're, you're, you're over, like as defined by the perception of your function by these other companies, you're by these other subsidiaries, right? Like, talk to me about like, have, are, are you happy with the progress? Do you wish, it, maybe you wish it was faster or something, but like, do you think that that's accurate and like, what could somebody learn from your approach? Because, I mean, everybody yeah. is fighting this. Like, everybody, yeah. you know, you're a great guest here because it's such a unique problem that you're solving, I think. But everybody yeah. faces this to some degree. Even if you're in a 100-person company, there are these That's little right. subcultures across the company. Support Absolutely. has one and ops has one and, and, yep. and so forth. And so there's similar kind of shapes to this thing, you know? Yep. No, exactly. And, you know, like I worked for a very centralized company, you know, there's silos everywhere you go, there's challenges and from a compliance perspective, no matter where you go. I think we are very uniquely challenged just because of the way we're structured. Um, And, you know, my approach has always been, it's just amplified in this environment because of the way we're structured. I'm even more mindful of it um, is, is just getting to know how people see things, how they see it, you know, their perspective using humor, uh, you know, is, a, has been, I don't know, it may not come across as, you know, very funny here, but you know, I, 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 you know, you get, you get to know people, you just develop this relaxedness and you get to have these kind of conversations that, that are important. And I think that approach has worked well for me. Um, historically, it works well for me here. Uh, no matter what culture I'm in, there's commonalities in, in, you know, joking around with somebody that I found to be the same no matter where I'm at in the world, right? People have a great sense of humor and you find those commonalities and you're able to, you know, you know, use your own personalities to kind of adapt to that in some way that I think has been very helpful. Um, can it be faster? Uh, I get very impatient, Um it, with with compliance and in the in the march of improving things, but I see great progress that I've done, um, that we've done collectively at RPM in the last four years, the last two years, uh, coming out of COVID. I think that has been for we didn't get to travel at all for you know my first international trip was uh, May of 21 to uh, Santiago, Chile, and uh, I've pretty much been on the road ever since. So it's it's been a huge opportunity coming out of post COVID to get out there see people how they see things um, and, uh, you know, understand things from their perspective, but we have a long ways to go. uh, But I'm very happy with how things have progressed. Um, You mentioned silos in what you, uh, in, in your last answer. And I think siloing, I've been surprised at how like natural it is. Um, Even as our company has grown it's like, I want there to be no silos. I want there to be no walls. And like, they just yep. sort of naturally start to erect. And this otherism starts to creep into an organization, you know, ops for, or sales versus marketing or whatever, right? There's a hundred yep. different examples of that. When yep. you think about like de-siloing uh, across RPM, how do you think about it from like a corporate perspective? And how do you also think about it from like an individual subsidiary perspective? And like, what are the warning signs you see? Or like, what are the tactics? Uh, yeah. You know, what are the tools you've sort of developed to like knock those silo walls down? Yeah, well, uh, so at RPM at our corporate headquarters, we're a hundred people, give or take, strong, and um, we have silos just within that small group. Yeah. We have IT, we have, you know, um, um, finance, and we have internal audit, we have legal, we have compliance, and we've gotten better. But it's it's been a situation uh, in that limited small culture where there's silos. so. My, you know, my frustrations, but also my opportunities has been to how do I bridge those silos just in that small group setting? So 
working more with uh, IT has been, uh, you know, huge opportunity. Because when I go out to a place somewhere in the world, um, there's a whole IT side of things that I'm not the expert on, but I know enough to inquire and dig in and ask questions. And I will partner with people at the corporate office, say, listen, this is where I'm going. Is there anything that you think would be important from an IT perspective to inquire about or learn about or ask about, right? And um, that's never been done before. So, you know, that has helped at the corporate level break down those silos. Um, and then at the subsidiary level, you're talking to people that normally I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily be on my radar uh, to add to my scope of time to speak with you know local IT people, but it's important. Right. It's it's right. not it's not built into my compliance audits, but it's a part of it because it's learning about the business, learning about um, you know different things and how they procure you know software and hardware. What are some of the basic IT controls that they do? Um, how are, you know, do we use an outside firm that handles tech support, right? All these things you can find out that aren't necessarily known that they're handling to solve their own local problems. And some things come out of that that are eye-opening. Some things come out of that that the company didn't know uh, at the head level. And how do we work through those, you know, potential data privacy issues? How do right. we work through those, you know, procurement issues and uh, security issues and, those types of things and segregation of duties and, you know, the, all those kind of things from an IT perspective um, has helped break down silos, both at the parent company level and certainly the, sub the subsidiary level. And I could apply that to uh, areas in, uh, you know, HR areas in legal right. as well. So uh, those are the things that I look for to take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah. Those motions are, can be applied kind of across these different departments and companies and so forth. Um, I learned, my dad taught me how to play chess on this little folding travel chess board. And yep. a couple of years ago, I was at a, a, a resort in the, you know, I don't know, it was in like, uh, I forget where it was, like, like Cancun maybe. And they had yep. on the beach, this big chess game, right? You know, like the life, not life size, but like four foot chess pieces. And that game that I learned on the little folding board worked fine over here. And I think what you're talking about is even in the hundred person company that you're a part of or the hundred person team that you're on at corporate, there's a lot yeah. of lessons you can learn that can be applied across the board here. That's right. That's right. Um, That's right. Exactly. so I have, I have a question for you. Um, how do you, I mean, you have such a mix of subsidiaries, right? From a size perspective yeah. and all that, how That's do right. you, um, how do you help your team kind of keep that materiality lens. Are you looking at materiality in terms of the whole organization? Are you trying to boil down materiality for like each individual company and coming up with like its own standard because that can be applied to financial audits, it can be applied to yep. all this kind of stuff. How do you navigate through that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It's, it's a challenging one because um, again, back to our structure, there could be a company that's just, you know, two to $5 million in revenue per year versus something that's, that's much, much bigger in revenue. And what's material, you know, materiality ultimately to the organization and a small company isn't really material, right? right? We could have a major issue in a small company, but it's not really material. Um, and we've had that, but they are material to that local business. Right. And they are potentially hugely impacting to that local business. You know, um, how uh, uh, an employee relations matter uh, can be hugely impactful in, in, in the culture, if an investigation is going on, that they're handling at the local level, maybe they're not handling it correctly, and things go from bad to worse. Uh, because, you know, whatever the nature of the investigation is, and you have complaints against management, or whatever the situation may be, that could be, if it's mishandled or it's serious, that can be hugely impactful to that organization. How are we going to get, you know, recruiting people, new people in if we got you know, a bad reputation of, of this is not a good place to work. All these kinds of things ultimately are not necessarily material to the parent company, but they are certainly impactful to that local business and their employees. And that goes back to the culture of what's the right thing to do, right? How do we make sure that the right thing is going to be done? How do we give a level of advice and support uh, to these matters that are disruptive potentially to a local business? Um that can be uh, stressful and uh, damaging in a lot of different ways. And that's somewhat of a change of 
mindset to higher level people where they've never really gotten into the weeds on what's happening at the local level. Right. Right. So that mindset is, is part of what I'm helping to, to influence and change is that small matters like that can be just as important and need to be seen with a level of importance because they need guidance and support. And, um, you know, it's going to potentially be a, maybe a little campfire that we put out. We don't want to ignore it where it's going to turn into a large forest fire. Yeah. And you don't want to also kind of run the risk of talking out of both sides of your mouth, right? Talking to a 2000 or a $2 million company and saying, Hey, you know, compliance matters and integrity matters and these values matter and these policies matter. And then something goes wrong and you're just like, well, your company doesn't sure. really matter. It does not, That's right. not, you know, because it matters a lot to them, to your point. Um, That's right. How do you convey that? How do you convey that to guys? And how do you, you know, I, I'm sure there's not like a silver bullet answer, but no. I just, I just find the problem that the problems that like the ship that you're sailing is a very interesting one. The yeah. storms that you inevitably go through are probably super interesting. And it's like, it's this probably ever evolving, you know, Gordian knot that you're trying to untie. Yeah, no, it, it, it is. And, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of people that are, have been in compliance can, can relate to some degree about the challenges. Um, there's no difference in the challenges that I have. I think in some ways they're just more magnified because mm-hmm. of the structure that we're in. Um, you know, there is no silver bullet. We, we, you know, we work largely in a, in, in a remote environment um, uh, post COVID before COVID people were flying all over the world all the time. There was a lot more engagement, but it wasn't from, the perspective and the types of, um, you know, conveyance that we're doing today. So we're still out there traveling, not as much as we used to before COVID, but we're getting out there and we're holding a lot of more trainings and, and development opportunities remotely uh, than we ever did before. So um, the other challenge that we have is staying on top of who's who in the organization. So there's turnover yeah. that happens at a management that we don't even know. Right. And you've about, built these right? relationships with these guys right. and then they're gone. And it's like, did that transfer? Did my goodwill and my jokes and that, humor transfer? Right. You know? That's right. My jokes didn't transfer over. They, <laughs> they, they died. So I have to come up with new jokes or I'm refreshing the same ones because they never heard them before, yeah. which is not a bad thing. Not a so, bad thing at all. Not a bad thing. So, yeah. So that's a challenge is, you know, you could have a, say, for example, a, a controller, um, or accounting manager, and, and, and they're gone. We don't necessarily know that at the RPM level. Um, you could have the vice president of sales gone, and, and, and they replace them. Um, we don't necessarily have that visibility in a very timely manner at, 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 at my level. So, yeah, it's, it, that's that constant other you know, challenging environment that we have to work with is knowing who's who, and then are they still who we think they are, right? Are they still the same people? So that's, that's a constant challenge. So there's no silver bill. So it's continuous, continuous, continuous education, communication, furthering that development of networks that, hey, I just understand now the bigger picture of this. And we just had a change in management. And I should probably uh, help communicate that out to the people in this department because they told me how important it is. And I understand why. Yeah. And I'm sure that um, you get some, I mean, you have some kind of a feedback loop, right? Like if you know, your main point of contact uh, at a large subsidiary gets replaced, then you obviously have to kind of dive back in and reestablish that point of connection with their replacement for maybe a director of sales. Maybe that's less important. And you, you're probably, as you said, kind of making those game game time decisions all the time because you're really running this sort of risk-based algorithm in your mind across whatever's popping up on your, your, your dashboard. That's right. Yeah. We can't, it's, you have to do a risk approach to it and, and, and figure out what your priorities are because, uh, you know, we have 16,000 people spread throughout our company throughout the world. We can't, we're, we're, we're a, we're a small, but mighty team. And, but yeah. we are small. <laughs> we, we're definitely small. We, you know, I have, I have what I do. I have a, uh, I have an employee that, that works for me. Uh, she's a CPA and she handles the finance aspects of, of the compliance audits and, and does wonderful. Um, and then I will have at times some various internal audit staff members that will help out on the compliance audits. Um, but that's, that's really it. And then I work obviously in collaboration with legal and compliance, the actual, you know, legal and compliance department. Um, and where do I spend my time and, and what are the issues that they see and uh, that I need to be aware of and how do we prioritize where I go in the, in the world? Because these audits can take, months at a time to go through and do them. Oh, right. So I can average between, you know, eight and 10 audits per year, uh, at various places throughout the world. And we have, you know, well over a hundred different subsidiaries. So 
that's the environment that I work in. Yeah. Um, those audits, them taking that long, um, you know, what do you do with the findings from the audits? Because sometimes they're A+, plus, sometimes they're a C. Yep. Uh, how do you sort of frame out the uh, impending audit with, you know, a group that maybe you haven't interacted with before to kind of get their participation on a real level that where you don't have that sort of stonewalling and you don't do the stuff that we used to do when our financial auditors came in and we would just jack up the freaking heat, cook them. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm kind of kidding, actually. I'm just yeah, kind of kidding. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's tough. Again, you know, it's, it's back to their perception of what the audit is to begin with and yeah. what, it's the, what it's designed to do. And the way that I try to, um, you know, uh, communicate that is, is that um, the realization of the, of, the, of the structure that we're in, we're decentralized, you know, the history of, of how things have, have been, some of our, and be honest about our challenges. We yeah. don't do a good job of, of communicating. We don't do a good job of, of oversight. Um, we've had this culture of being entrepreneurial and that's been wonderful for the success of our long-term success of our company. However, from a compliance perspective, we got gaps, we got opportunities and it's done to help prevent those things from disrupting your business. Right. And, um, you, you approach it from a, from that type of perspective, um, with some of other types of things that I say, and that starts to, you know, lower the temperature uh, you know, get them to see things a little bit differently than a traditional SOX control audit, right? Which we do every year, which every, not every one of our companies goes through a SOX audit because again, we have to prioritize where right. we spend our, our time at. So a lot of the companies that I focus on thro- fall below that threshold of a SOX audit where they've never even gotten an audit to begin with. Ever. Right, right. So they're completely new to the game in a lot of a lot of ways and these are these far small far and away places but sometimes those small far away places bring about the highest compliance risks and that's a different mindset than understanding what the risks are from a SOX perspective right it can mean that hey my uh, sales guy in Puerto Rico uh, you know uh, was in Guatemala and he you know paid a, a government official fifty dollars for you know what took him out to lunch or whatever who knows what? And that might be small and insignificant to them, but it's important compliance thing to understand what that really means and what's the potential risk there, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of environment that 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 you know we find ourselves in in these small, far away places is that lack of engagement and that understanding that they don't have about compliance concerns because they've never seen it before. They don't understand it. And again, back to the different cultures and what that means in different places in the world. What it means to pay, give a gift, receive a gift, pay something, have somebody pay for you, right? Those types of compliance concerns don't necessarily mean the same thing from country to country. And um, so, you know, that's, again, that's just the the challenge in the environment that I work in. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that you're on this kind of small but mighty team. Yeah. Um, and to be effective in a small and mighty team, I think you need a lot of, you know, cross collaboration. Yep. And that's probably happens on a micro level for you, but probably across your organization, given all these subsidiaries of different sizes, there's probably a ton of, op- of opportunity for cross collaboration and, you know, cross pollination of learnings and stuff like that. What have you learned in, in this realm, this cross, this cross, you know, collaboration realm that folks can take to kind of supercharge that? Because again, I just feel like even in, a, even in our company, which is nowhere near the size of yours, Mm-hmm. I wish that we were collaborating more. I wish I wish that we weren't getting siloed, as I said before. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's it, it for me. It's a constant challenge. Like, how do we carve out the time to make sure it's profitable time where it's actually yep. valuable for guys that we can move move forward at a more sort of you know efficient pace or something? Yeah, that's it's tough. Um, I think you know what I try to to influence in anything that we do is that we are sending the same message no matter who it is. Got it. Right, and so. You know, that's where people at the corporate level, do they understand from a compliance perspective, what are some of the key points that they can incorporate in their in their business, in their way of thinking, in their communication to their teams, right? I've always said this throughout my whole career when I talk to management and talk to leadership about compliance and compliance risks and culture and those types of things, right? It, it doesn't cost them anything to speak about what's right, what's the right thing to do, right? And creating that environment of being comfortable to speak up about things and concerns and ask questions, right? It costs a, a manager in a business nothing to do that 
but it potentially creates so much value down the road right. um, in, in doing that. So whether I'm talking to and trying to influence uh, people in, in marketing in our company, people in, in human resources, people in IT, people in finance, are they saying the same types of things that are consistent from a compliance perspective that I'm teaching, that I'm influencing throughout the organization? Because I don't want I don't want a manager in somewhere in Dubai or somewhere in Europe to just hear that messaging from me. Right. And so if we're on the same page with that from operations and manufacturing, and they're incorporating that language in what they do. To me, that that would mean more than almost anything. Yeah, I love that that phrase. Um, so we're, we'll we'll just call this an even trade because I'm going to steal that. Uh, but it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything to put a uh, a speak up thing on the the you know your email sig, or bringing that up you know once a month in your weekly meetings or something, right? Like trying to get that environment going, that right. that opens up a lot of opportunity for, uh, as my friend uh, Hema calls it, uh, crowdsourcing risk intelligence at scale. That's what we got to sure. do. That that's the only way that I think. Uh, any of us, you know, and, and, you know, maybe you are kind of a, uh, an extreme example of this challenge because you have this sort of small and mighty team and you have a hundred plus organizations of all these different sizes across the world. Uh, you can't do that job on your own, you know, no right. offense, but like you need that participation nope. and these folks That's have right. to be, you know, helping to, you know, they have to raise their hand and say, there's an issue here, uh, so that you can not be sort of in the dark and just having to arrive at that on your own. That's right. Yep. And so, yeah, just just having that ability to leverage those people to try to incorporate that kind of messaging in their business operations. Um, it's hard to, to quantify if, they're, if that's actually done, but that's what I try to influence. Yeah. So I always love to ask this question. If you can go back in time, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, I know we're, we're running out of time here, but uh, before yeah. I ask you this question, um, I think you just did this, um, that, that FBI thing, the FBI compliance course. Yeah. Tell me about that. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it was. Um, um, gl I'm glad they let me in the building. So <laughs> uh, um, the I've been trying to get into that uh, academy for eight years. And for whatever reason, I'm not sure I understand their selection, but I started to get the hint that they, they didn't want me until uh, until I finally got the uh, the uh, the email that says, hey, you're you're selected as part of this uh, this class this year, and I, I just was ecstatic because I thought it was awesome to do that. It really made me um, wish I could go back in time and, and kick my kick my younger self rear in uh, choosing. Even though I love compliance, but I was like, I went through the whole FBI thing, go through the whole um, understanding of of their internal workings to a degree. And then going through their museum and everything, it's just like I should have been in a special agent. <laughs> get you a badge, I get you one I of those saw, FBI jackets. Yeah, I just like, I man, I just, I loved everything that they did. Uh, but it was really about uh, understanding from the internal workings of the FBI how their compliance program works for them, right? Um, it wasn't so much about what they would do externally um, for companies and compliance failures, but how they have structured and the challenges that they have. Um, and talking about uh, their compliance program. And there were some added bonuses there. They brought in a, a DOJ official. Um, we were able to talk about different things from a compliance perspective for our companies. And uh, But it's really learning about the FBI's inner workings and from a compliance perspective and their ability to handle internal complaints and working through those processes and things like that. But ultimately, it was learning so much about the FBI that I didn't know about before, which is why I wish I could go back and, and, and start down that career path. <laughs> um, yeah. I would recommend it for anybody to, to go through that. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds so, uh, so unbelievably interesting. And so when I think about sort of a compliance program, this is going to be very crude, but like there's this kind of yin and yang. You know, the yin is maybe like the policies and the structure and the um, – you know, the tools that we use and the yang is maybe the, uh, the cultural thing, the more amorphous, you know, culture of compliance, where in that conversation or where in that, in that, uh, that academy was most of the focus and what on the sort of culture side was surprising. So uh, on the culture side, it was, it was surprising and maybe not surprising, but because when you think about, 
you know, the, the sensitivities and confidentiality of things within, yeah. within the FBI is that, is that, are, 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 are things really anonymous? Like, you know, it, externally you talk about a company that will hire, you know, Ethico or Navex or whatever to be that third party, independent third party to take that intake of, of a complaint or concern, right? That doesn't work within the FBI because right. you're potentially dealing with sensitive confidential information, you know, about, about security matters, you know, if somebody does something. So you're still reporting things internally. And and how do you make an agent feel like they're going to be protected by reporting, even even though it's handled by a select team, even though it's handled in all, in all the possible confidential security ways of submitting the complaint internally, it's still internally. Right. Right. To the organization. So the fear of retaliation, certainly in any law enforcement organization, the FBI is no different. It's got to be of such great concern for anybody to do that, let alone the FBI, especially because those matters are being reported internally. So they talked a little, they talked some, obviously some about that, about how do we improve our own internal culture to make people feel comfortable in speaking up? Because you look through the history of, of, of some of the, of the issues that have affected the FBI from an es espionage perspective, right. right? Is that, were there examples of, of things that happen where people have been concerned or saw red flags uh, of things within the FBI that ultimately led to, you know, if they would have if they would have raised them earlier uh, or felt comfortable to speak them up because they were a supervisory level position and they're like, man, that doesn't seem right. Did things get missed that could have got caught sooner if they weren't? afraid of that. Right? right. So I think that's, that's a unique situation for the FBI and any, any law enforcement is how those things are handled internally. We struggle with that and retaliate fear of retaliation, totally. no matter what, right. It's a different level internally to an organization like the FBI. And so they are acutely aware of that and learning about how they try to deal with that reality of that added concern of retaliation that already exists, no matter where you're at, um, was, was good to hear that, one, recognize the problem. Two, what are they trying to do about it that's unique to them um, and their culture, right? Because it's just, it's going to be continuously a challenge for the FBI to, to deal with those internal concerns being raised in, in a timely manner and without the fear of retaliation. So I think the more effort that they, I saw them talk about that and the programs that they have to try to deal with that, uh, it was really, really good to see. Yeah, it's so fascinating, right? Like those uh, – that fear of retaliation is probably the biggest thing that prevents people from raising their hand. And right. to your point in the FBI, it's sort of this – you know, as you said, it's this sort of like highly concentrated risk. It's maybe even bigger uh, than everywhere right. else. You know, I think the reason – or a reason that I love ethics and compliance so much is because it's like – it's everywhere. You know, FBI yeah. does – the FBI doesn't have like a sales team, so they don't have sales challenges. But right. they have people challenges, and they have to navigate through these things. And, you know, I think – uh, you know, before this conversation, I would have kind of ignorantly thought, well, you know, these are a bunch of sort of like law enforcement people, you know, highly disciplined. Maybe they're from the military. They probably don't yeah. have a lot of these challenges. But to your point, they have maybe even more of them given given their setup and given the, you know, how how intense it can be and the kind of information that's that's flowing through that organization, you know. Yeah, I mean, you have, uh, you know, just the things that potentially can, can happen is you have somebody that um, – you know, internally is, is accessing a database for their own, you know, totally their own selfish purposes, right? right? Not tied to investing and looking up information about somebody, right? Doing their yeah. own thing. Right? Who went out to lunch with my ex-wife kind of thing. You know? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to vet the, the ex-wife's new boyfriend <laughs> exactly. or, whatever, or my, 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 my daughter's boyfriend. I'm going to run them through the FBI <laughs> database, right? all these kinds of things. Right. And, and, you know, there, those are different level of concerns that, uh, and how do they deal with that? Right. And sexual harassment or, you know, discrimination and, uh, you know, all those kind of things that every organization can be faced with. There's no, the FBI is no different. It's just that added level of culture of law enforcement mentality, military mentality that isn't comfortable necessarily in raising concerns within that organization. Oh, it's so cool. All right. Yeah. So my other question, you can't say the FBI thing because you already said all that. Right. Uh, if you can go back in time uh, to young Brian and give him a piece of advice, what do you think that is? What is, a, what is a thing that you wish you learned earlier that would have really changed your impact or accelerated you forward or, you know, call, you know would have you know, helped you not fall off the bike and skin your knee or something? Yeah, no. That, uh, so I was a late bloomer. I didn't, I didn't go to college. I mean, I did go to college, but I kept, 
I kept being a bum pretty much, <laughs> you know, on people's couches throughout my twenties um, until I got married and had a kid. So I didn't actually get my degree until a little bit later in my own life. So I'd certainly get my degree earlier, but I would be, if I could go back and let, knowing what I know now, I would have got my degree um, probably in a more finance accounting role. Um, and I, if I love being in, in compliance, but it's the, it's probably my weak area is the accounting finance side. And that has become more important in the compliance. Certainly what I do is more finance and accounting um, focused. That's why I have somebody working for me that's a CPA because yeah. I can't do that job, right? Um, and But that's my weak point. And, uh, but I think it's, it brings a, a, a different level of, of, of expertise and value to a compliance role is understanding financial transactions. And we, you know, we spent a lot of time focusing on the ethics and, and, and culture side of things, which is hugely important. And I'm certainly, com- that's where my comfort zone is. But my uncomfortable zone is, is the finance and accounting world, where t- transactions that actually can lead to compliance failures, um, noting potential areas of bribery or corruption or um, you know, books and records violations, they're not easy to spot, right? Um, they're not easy to spot in traditional internal audit. And so I feel a little bit more responsible to identify those things from a potential compliance failure issue concern. Uh, but that's noted weak area for me. So I would go back in time and, and focus on more specific types of education focused around finance and accounting. If I was going to continue down the compliance field. Yeah, it's it's so interesting that 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 the marriage of the sort of people side and again, maybe it's the yin and yang side, but the marriage of the people side and like that's kind of, you know, hard analytic side is really which you've solved, obviously. I mean, you're a you're a very persuasive person. I could just tell just from, you know, talking with you. Uh, and you sort of solve for that in the composition of your team. But again, you know, the more tools I can have in my toolbox, the less times I got to come knocking on your door to uh, get a saw or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and if it gets me, a, you know, gets me better job security by having that, you know, I'm actually taking a few classes in accounting right now just oh, to wow. feel a little bit more comfortable in that world, which I, I traditionally have not. So that's what I'm doing just to help myself out a little bit. So, I mean, just looking at your LinkedIn page, you're kind of a continuous learner. Oh, wow. We are yep. over. So we can wrap up. Have you always sure. been that way? Have you always been a continuous learner? Or no. Is that no, something no, no. that... I was, like I said, I was, a, I was a bum in my 20s. So, you know, uh, you, know you, you, you have a few guys over and have a party. And that was pretty much my life through the 20s, right? Yeah. But getting married my, and having a kid, man, that, that got me. Like, I started freaking freaking out. Like I got to get my stuff together. Yeah. And it's been almost like anxiety where I like, I got to continue to learn and develop and that's not going to stop because I want to make sure that I provide for my family and, and, and provide the right life that I want for them. So that doesn't, that mentality has not stopped since <laughs> for about 28 years now, but, uh, um, yeah, that's, that's where I find myself today. Yeah. I mean, however you get there, however you can get into that continuous improvement mode, the better, you know? Uh, Anyways, we're over. Thank you so much for coming. This was uh, really a lot of fun. Um, Brian, appreciate you. Um, Yeah, and we will see you next time. Appreciate it, Nick. Thanks a lot. Take care. All right, bye-bye.